On POTUS, we're going to play a little game, twist things around a little bit. Our Plays to Run segment, typically on Fridays, we discuss the politics and the plays to run. Today, a bit of a twist because, number one, we're going to have two people talking about it. Number two, we're going to talk about an event that we were sort of wondering if it was going to come down yesterday. It did not. And that is, of course, the Supreme Court decision on the Affordable Care Act. Joining me in the studio, Alan Kelly. Alan, of course, our regular guest on Fridays the CEO of the Bethesda-based consultancy playmaker system. It's playstorun.com. Michael Cornfield, who was back with us, has uh, been away for a couple of years, but he's acting director of George Washington University's political management program and both very much steeped in the discussion of the place for the presidency. Alan, welcome. Good to see you. Michael, good to see you again. It's been a while. Great to be back, Tim. All right. So we still await the decision from the Supreme Court, and clearly we've got some political I guess, games to be played here and the plays to run. Alan, let's kick it off. We've started talking about how the Republicans and Democrats are going to play this. Let's let's look at it. How do you view this simply from that strategic standpoint right now? How how does it play out? Well, to understand that, in in a class that I teach at George Washington University, we we took the Department of Defense war game convention of four sides, Mm -hmm. uh, not to be political, but blue red, green, and white, and we enlisted our students into various roles. We had Kathleen Sebelius being played, we had Mitt Romney being played, we had the American Bar Association being played, and we used that to to, to develop some clarity on what could happen uh, with the decision coming down. We simulated two different outcomes, one where the court upholds all of the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, and the second game that we played was where it uh, it supported the act, but it threw out the mandate. We could have done many other scenarios as well. It's all the time allowed. Right. But the uh, and Mike, in fact, uh, uh, and one other professor were a part of this. And so for some months now, we've been studying the possible outcomes of this. One of the things that's quite clear is that you have a lot of players here. Uh, we've been trying to find the right uh, uh, euphemism for this. You might call it a, a cluster fest. Uh, There are many different interests that can weigh in here in proportion to the size of the industry or all the sub-industries that go into health care. So there's going to be a lot of of opinions to be registered. It's a lot of people holding their hands up to say, listen to me, I have something to say. A lot of people positioning, some people depositioning, many people repositioning. Well, Michael, uh, I guess this brings up the question, and that is, uh, you know, to what end? In other words, the spin in some ways is political. It's not going to change the decision. Typically, when we talk about, for example, Congress and they're discussing a bill uh, or they're discussing pending legislation, you might be wanting to make a persuasive case so that somebody will change their vote or there will be an influence on the vote. No influence on the Supreme Court once the decision is made. So what is the point of whatever spin comes afterwards or whatever positioning comes afterwards from any one of these individuals or groups? Tim, this is a really unusual situation. This is the Supreme Court ruling on a law before it goes into effect. I don't know if we've ever had that before. The law that was passed in 2010 has numerous provisions that did go into effect, but the ones that are being ruled on for their constitutionality don't go into effect until 2014. So this is a case of judicial preemption, to use one of Allen's uh, 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 playmaking terms. Um, It's not just activism, potentially, it's aggrandizement. It's the first time, I believe, the court has said, we can rule on things before they go into effect. What they're ruling on, of course, are are two principal uh, uh, features of this law. One is the individual mandate, the requirement that uh, every citizen in the United States, uh, if they're not covered otherwise, needs to get insurance coverage or pay um, a fee in the high hundreds of dollars. Normally in a court case you would have plaintiffs who are protesting the fact that they had to pay that fee. The plaintiffs in this case are protesting in advance, in abstraction. Um, Nobody's paid anything. Uh, And that uh, affects uh, how everybody is going to react to this because outside of Washington, since it hasn't really permeated uh, American life, I don't think there's going to be a big reaction. The only people who have noticed it so far are people who have actually benefited, like those who have kids who are up to the age of 26. Or that people is who have been a covered. very important constituency. Right. That that may be the only important constituency, depending on how we rule, because Obama, as we know, is campaigning uh, and wants young people uh, to come out and, and work for him and vote for him, uh, which is why also we're watching this week what happens with the student loan interest rate. Um, so, yes, those people have been covered. That did go into effect, and, and they would be among 
uh, those uh, whose, whose lives would change depending on what the court says. The other big ruling besides the individual mandate is whether or not uh, it's constitutional for the Congress to tell the state governments that they have to expand Medicaid, which is aid to the poor, not to be confused with Medicare, which is aid for people over 65, which is not at play here. Mm-hmm. And in each of these cases, the individual mandate and the the expansion of Medicaid, we're talking about 16 million people, roughly. But again, it, we're, we're talking about them, what happens in, in 2004. So this means everybody is going to be reacting to something that hasn't happened yet. Mm-hmm. How often does that happen in Washington? Right, right. That's Michael Cornfield. He's with us. Alan Kelly is too. I'm Tim Farley as we look at the Supreme Court and, again, an impending decision on the Affordable Care Act. And, Alan, still it makes you wonder about the plays because you got your four sides. They're all lined up and they're not exactly going in to do battle and they're not running at each other. But there are games to be played. So what is the end goal? Is it to, to figure out how things get changed? And clearly we have to wait until we actually get substance behind the decisions. But is it about trying to find a new working solution? Because there seems to be, if not unanimity, certainly a sense that there needs to be something done about health care costs in this country. So what is the game to be played here? What is the game well, that is afoot? Uh, it, it depends. <laughs> and it, it, it depends on how, how this judgment comes down. Mm-hmm. I mean, certainly one of the, uh, the outcomes here is that they could decide that they shouldn't rule. <laughs> Though Mike, Mike points out uh, in an earlier conversation we had that that's unlikely. They did take the case. But uh, how they rule will have a lot to do with the plays that are run. One of the things that we know, however, is that Mitt Romney, as a, a major focal player in this little drama, big drama, is that he's essentially bound up. He's duct taped on this. He can't really speak to it directly uh, because of his own work and his own signature uh, bill in Massachusetts. So he's compromised, if you will, no matter how this thing goes down. He's the father of the mother of all health care acts, <laughs> I guess. I think like that. Thank you. Um, uh, and uh, so he will rely very, very heavily on his surrogates to, to do the bidding, uh, whether it is uh, however the judgment goes down. And I think that's really very unusual in this case. I mean, he he must be beside himself that he can't play directly. I think that's one of the things we surely know that comes out of the games. Mm-hmm. So how does he play it then? What does he do? I mean, does he stay silent? Surrogates only. Uh, well, he's he, going to be he, asked he, the question, He can though, right? say some perfunctory things, right. uh, which some people say he's very good at saying. I will repeal Obamacare on the first day of yes. my presidency, right. yes. which is meaningless because yes. there is no such thing yeah. as Obamacare. Right. And for example- But it sounds good. And it may be that he doesn't have to even do that because it may be a moot point when we get to that, if, in, if indeed there is the Affordable Care Act, if it is declared unconstitutional. That would but, be a game changer. But uh, I, I, if the whole thing is declared unconstitutional, well, yes, if, then we will see lots of action. And and if the mandate is undone, does that not undo the f- the fundamental funding mechanism of this and uh, render the rest of it? Believe it or not, that's another question, is whether or not the individual mandate is severable from the other components of the law. So it all fits together. It's it all just, fits together. You know. and, and my view is, is that the key player to watch is going to be the insurance companies. Mm-hmm. The insurance companies are already looking into 2014. They've got to figure out a business model that that works. And if the insurance companies either praise the decision or um, condemn the decision, more importantly, if they start changing their rates, then all the other players will 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 immediately react, and and we'll see uh, whether or not this this affects the election and and how it affects. Uh, people's lives. In 2010, right before the Senate was going to vote on the Affordable Care Act, two insurance companies announced that they were going to hike the cost of health insurance by as much as 40 percent, and it had a big impact on the vote because that's something people can understand instantly. They Mm -hmm. can't understand all the provisions, but if you tell people your rates are going up 40 percent, then campaigners have something to say to their audiences and to the voters. Right. I think one of the things we can look for in the gamesmanship here is that if unless the courts do anything but uphold Affordable Care Act altogether, then I think that various constituents and players are going to draw them into the gridlock equation. They're going to be officially welcomed <laughs> or accused. The Supreme as, Court, you mean? Yes, mm-hmm. as party now to the to the entire macro problem of political gridlock. What's the value of that, though? I mean, it's not to make the Supreme Court react, right? Because they won't. I mean, this is one of the this is the hallmark of the Supreme Court is that they make their well, decisions absent politics. They're not going to leave the, until the they die or word, decide to retire. The operative word there is value. I mean. Uh, 
Obama is in a is in a position of saying, if he wins it all, I can govern through this mess in so many words. And if he doesn't win it or even parts of it, he can say, this is a very difficult system to govern, and I am doing my best to prevail. He and he can point to run screenplays on 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 the Supreme Court as as now being part and parcel. He can say in so many words, or maybe his surrogates can say it for him. Who exactly is president here in this system? What exactly did we mean when we had with this checks and balances system? Has it gone too far? Mm-hmm. But I don't know if he wants to make that a campaign issue. That even no. even FDR waited until after the election before he announced what is really the only response to uh, that a president has. I mean, his it, attempt to pack the Supreme correct. Court. Correct. Right. And and we had a big uh, op-ed piece on the the front page of the Outlook section of the Washington Post advocating that we expand the Supreme Court to nineteen. Uh, Jonathan Turley's piece. The correct. Other day. Right. There's nothing in the Constitution that says how many members of the Supreme Court there ought to be. So it is a move that can be made. But whether you would make it in the middle of a, of, of a presidential campaign, gosh, I don't even know if FDR would and have not, done and that. And not to go too far afield with that particular piece, because I was reading and thinking, well, what's better? Is 11 better? Why is 11 better? I mean, it's still, I mean, six is bad, because he did mention at one time there were six. And of course, if a, an individual recuses, if you get a tie vote, then it, then it defaults to the previous decision. But I guess I was trying to figure, do you want to have 150 people making a decision? Because that was one of the numbers. There was some hundreds, I guess. Well, if you're a player, yeah. you, you look at it differently. You don't look at it as as the professor did and say, what's the abstract best number to have on the Supreme Court? You look at how many do I get to a point? Right. How many more will I have in the next four years? And what will that get me in terms of upholding the legislation that Congress sends to me to sign? And if you're the out party, you're doing the same sort of vote counting. How many do we need? Mm-hmm. Uh, how many do we want to let the the, uh, the incumbent president have over the next four years? Do we do this gradually or not? So so they'll all be looking at it through the prism of what can I do with this? But to, to your point, Michael, this is a pretty, pretty difficult thing to, to craft into a campaign message, is it not? I, mean, I, I think it is. I don't think a lot of people are going to vote on the basis of uh, – uh, changing the the constitutional system and it opens you up, does it not, Alan? To uh, sore loser type of of counter accusations. If yeah. if if the president yeah. goes yeah. on the campaign trail and says, yeah. "I need ten more Supreme Court justices." Yeah. That, whoever, that hands the who, Republicans a, a ready is, response. Whichever party is largely seen to be the loser is going to be the recipient of very various baits and baiting plays and call-outs. And it seems to me that the, that losing party, probably their interests are best served if they shut up, mm-hmm. if they in fact don't rise to the bait. If maybe uh, if Obama doesn't get it, you don't really call it the shut up play, do you? No, not no. <laughs> no. But uh, but gee, um, but but I think that if Obama, for instance, doesn't get everything he wants to, he might be well served to go on vacation or to have business that sort of officially precludes him from answering or, or answering it or getting into it because he'll only be whipping it up. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and to that point, I mean, the president has said before that he would have issues if the Supreme Court did not embrace what constitutional principles it has always embraced. Uh, There have been other senators who have said that uh, if the court does not decide in favor of the Affordable Care Act, that they will be engaging in the kind of judicial activism that Republicans find so repugnant. And what you're saying is that if indeed that does happen, they should just sort of say, well, they've spoken and now we move along because they are the Supreme Court and that's the final word. Well, Mike this morning is going a new term that I haven't heard before. That's judicial, judicial aggression. <laughs> and, uh, well, if you're going to rule on things before pre- they go into effect, that, pre- that goes beyond Marbury versus Madison. That's not judicial well, review. That, that's that, a, was, that was also part of the process, correct, it, in lower it, courts, because there was a question about if you have to set up systems, would it be not better to, to, to not set those systems up, which might cost a lot of money in the states, would have to move mountains, not literally, but they would have to do a lot of work in advance of the actual execution of the program. And that was why the courts decided that even though there's not an individual withstanding in front of the courts that it would make sense at least to address this prior That's to correct. the law's and they're, execution. They're, they, that is one of the four things they're expected to rule on is whether or not they can, under those circumstances, whether it is legitimate for the court uh, to rule on a provision before it goes fully into effect. Can you imagine effect. if the court decides that, they, you know, we, by the way, we believe that we do not have, we should not be ruling on it now, and so we're going to wait until it actually goes into effect Yeah, I refer to that as a prank. Because that's that's how that, that that the court has been playing with us for for 
over a year if they do that. But uh, if they do that, that will make that will definitely draw them into uh, the the gridlock uh, you know, equation. Mm-hmm. They, they will become permanently part of the discussion uh, or the vexation for why we can't move anything forward now. Tim, can I talk about one group of people that doesn't really have a a, a seat at the table? Please. Those are the 50 million Americans who are uninsured, um, some of whom would be covered by this and some of whom would not. And and by this, I mean that while we have a couple of progressive groups, Families USA, uh, Healthcare for America Now, uh, and while we have in, in a different context some members of the Tea Party who are co- healthcare consumers or not able to be healthcare consumers, they aren't really well organized. They don't have... Um, a pack. They don't have a, a charismatic spokesman who will go stand in front of the Supreme Court uh, and talk after the decision comes out. And so that means that that when we're talking about who's going to be making plays, we're talking about people who may act on be, on their behalf, but they don't really have the way, say, you know, the uh, people who are on Medicare have the AARP. Mm-hmm. They're organized. Um, these people, these these groups of people who are uninsured or underinsured, don't have a, a a political organization advocating their interests in this game. How many of them are people who are un, uninsured by choice? That's a really good point. That's one of the reasons that they're not well organized is because it is, as with people who don't vote, it's actually a cover term that includes several different types of groups. There are the the young invincibles, as some people call them, people who are in their, their 20s. Who I'm see, not going to get sick. That's, uh, that's exactly. The group right that's now. one group. There are poor people who cannot afford it. Uh, there are undereducated people. Uh, there are illegal immigrants um, who go into emergency care rooms and who are covered and this is where the two big decisions intersect in a way. Uh, so, so there are at least three groups, and there are probably a couple I, I'm leaving out, who are for one reason or another not insured. And nobody has, has got them coalesced and, and ready to comment and ready to vote one way or another, depending so be- on the outcome of the decision. So because they're not organized uh, like these others are, that's actually a flaw in the game and the simulations that we undertook. There, mm-hmm. there, we didn't have individual um, individuals like that playing. So it, it's much harder to project and simulate how exactly they'll react, whether or not they're important and what they'll do about it. They are important in the sense that you have 50 million, so that's a big number. Well, and they yeah. are important in, yes, in other ways. But the point you're making and from, from our discussion, which is how this plays politically, is it's difficult to tell what kind of a power or what kind of a role they'll play in any post-decision arguments and, and discussions of the issue. Constituencies can organize, and so perhaps the sort of the, the sort of judgment would would draw that out, and we would have a different dynamic coming up. So, so that group of people, if they become aggrieved, awaits their Thurgood Marshall or their Cesar Chavez or um, their Rick Santelli. Mm-hmm. If you will, or or or, or uh, the CNBC, or uh, the CNBC, right? Uh, they're, they're awaiting someone to say, "Hey, what about us?" Right, and then I'm somebody else comes in and the says, Howard Beale yeah. today." Right, exactly. Yeah. That could happen. Michael Cornfield with us, uh, Alan Kelly. Also, as we go through the plays for the presidency, in this particular case, we're talking about the Supreme Court decision on on health care. And I guess this question would be now, which is, uh, what? How does Mitt Romney play this again? And let's just sort of summarize if we can. Does he tout this? I mean, John Boehner, the Speaker of the House the other day, said there will be no spiking of the of the football in the end zone if this indeed, if the Supreme Court overturns the health care law. And I understand there are possible permutations. But aside from Mitt Romney, uh, anything else that he does? I mean, does, does, does he say this is our opportunity to show that we can move forward and do what needs to be done? Or we're going to see, see a very flat responses. He'll participate. He'll be active. But largely flat and not strategic. It we'll, sounds like we'll what you're see, saying we'll is that very well oiled surrogates working for him. This doesn't no sound like a big outcome. this doesn't sound like a big political exciting moment for either side in this we're, case. We're, we're here in the middle of June. And, uh, you know, and the, the timing, I think, is an issue here. It's uh, this is really too early to really affect the, the large masses of people who will wake up roughly at the convention time. Um, it is a time uh, that um, the that I think that um, lawmakers can can take to sit back and, and weigh this. I mean, it, the news cycle on this could be very, very long. Um, 
And it doesn't look like there is a distinct uh, upside for either party on this. So yeah, I think you're going to see a lot of activity by a lot of constituents, but both parties, I think, are going to play this relatively close, relatively I, I, quiet. I agree with that. That's a standard thing we teach at the school, which is if you don't have anything to gain from talking about something, don't talk about it. And it's not as though there aren't a lot of other issues to talk about. There's taxes. There's the deficit. There's immigration. Mm-hmm. Egypt. There's yeah. Egypt. There's Syria. Sure. Europe. Um, and the um, economy. Uh, and the economy. Oh, yes. And the economy. Now, I, I, this does play into the economy because some people say that what's really driving the deficit more than anything else mm-hmm. is health care costs. But that's an abstraction. And, and Alan's right. Neither Obama nor Romney has a clear advantage to press by talking about this. So since they don't, they won't. I ask this because the the question is, in, in some ways, the idea of whether or not it has an effect on the image of the man who is the president. And I ask that because constitutional law professor and yet somebody who did not see the constitutional tea leaves, quite frankly, like a lot of constitutional lawyers that I had spoken to over the course of this in the beginning, many of them just laughing off the idea that this would even make it to the Supreme Court, much less be overturned by the Supreme Court. But the other side of this is that this was the signature achievement and indeed the priority for the first two years of the presidency. And that being shown now by many Republicans or being touted by many Republicans as you've you've frittered away the time that you had to do important things and you spent your time on this and and, and it gets over. Well, if I were the White House and responding to that, mm-hmm. I would change the subject. But yes. here's how I would change it. I would say You know what? The Supreme Court invalidated one part, a very important part, and and I'm I'm, I'm assuming here five, four individual mandate. If they throw out the entire law, you run against that. Mm -hmm. And and you say that 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 the Supreme Court has has contravened the Congress of the United States and not just the president. Checks and balances is out of control. Then then you really then then they respond with with constitutional overreach by the keepers of the Constitution. Exactly. Dare you say that, sir? (laughs) Exactly. But if it's just one provision, albeit a key provision, or even if it's just two provision, you start to fix it. And they they have the tools uh, to fix it. And you you talk about you talk about other things. You don't if, if you're explaining a mistake that you made, you're you're losing. Mm-hmm. So so you don't want to get into that um, Monday morning quarterbacking of the first two years of the Obama presidency. Romney can't do too much about this either way because of his own legacy and his own complicity in this sort of law in Massachusetts. Obama, if he gets what he wants, in a way doesn't need to say anything. It'll all be said for him. It was his key signature led piece of legislation. He succeeded. He can legislate. And wh- who to thunk? A community organizer. But if he loses, there are so many other, as Mike points out, productive things, more productive things for him to go do and spend his time on. So I, I guess my prediction is that we're going to see um, notable underreactions from the heads of both parties, virtually speaking. Is that a play? An underreaction? Is yeah, that... it's a pass or it's a, a pause. Pass. Okay. It's, it's a very uh, low, low engagement. Um uh, play on on our spectrum of possibilities. The other person who was really implicated in that story that you you just retold, Tim, is Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi pushed this law through as much as Obama did, maybe even more, because Obama, you remember, said, "I'm going to let Congress deal with it," and it wasn't until the end that he came through. And it was Nancy Pelosi, when she was Speaker, who saw this as the culmination of a hundred years of Democratic uh, uh, advocacy for for health care legislation and the the crowning point of her career. Whether she'll remain quiet and what she would do with Democratic uh, congressional campaign funds is something to watch. And how well behaved she will be will be very interesting. <laughs> what to what level of control will she be the partner? She is she a be lady, the proxy? sir. Yes, but will she be talking her own line or the administration's? I think it will be interesting if it is that important to her. You've reminded me of things like deem and pass that were so much a part of the lexicon at the time. That was some of the parliamentary leisure demand, the sleight of hand that was being played to make sure that they didn't actually have to have votes on certain parts of this so that it could move through without actually having to come to a vote. It was pretty fascinating stuff to watch, but we'll see how it turns out. Always great to have you in here, Alan Kelly, and plays2run.com. That is the numeral two. And uh, Michael Cornfield, do you have a website that you refer people to? GSPM.org. GSPM.org. Thank you, gentlemen, and uh, we look forward to having you back. Thank you. Thanks.